In this video, I show you how to get started with EIP2535 proxy contracts without installing anything on your computer. Hi, I'm Ed Zinda, and this is What the Funk. In a previous video, I talked about EIP2535 or the Diamond Proxy Standard. Diamond proxies are a really cool way to build complex, upgradable smart contracts. But on top of trying to choose a framework to use like Foundry or Hardhat, you also have to install some libraries and diamonds can be a little bit tricky to set up. In this video, we're gonna skip all that. and I'm gonna show you how you can work with diamond proxies by just using your web browser. Before we get started, if you're new, here at What The Funk, we talk about all things Web3 and blockchain development. If that's something that interests you, go ahead and subscribe to this channel. Make sure to click that bell notification icon so you can stay up to date whenever I post a new video. Let's get into it. So the first thing we need to do is go to remix.ethereum.org. I've talked about Remix before, but if you don't know, Remix is a web-based IDE for building Ethereum smart contracts. So here I have an empty workspace. I'm going to create a new file called Funk Diamond. Now with my Solidity file created, I'm just going to add the pragma and the comments at the top. So here I have an empty contract, but it can't be considered a diamond because it needs to implement a bunch of different functions to actually act as a diamond. Now I'm not gonna go into these functions in detail. I'll probably end up doing that in a later video, but I'm gonna show you how you can add one simple library to turn this empty contract into a valid diamond contract. We're gonna be using a library called Solid State. And the great thing about Remix is it allows you to import NPM packages directly without having to install by using the NPM CLI or any of that. You just pick the NPM package and you can actually import any Solidity contracts from that package. So I'm going to import that now. So here you can see I've imported solid state contracts. And from that library, I've pulled the solid state diamond contract from the proxy slash diamond directory. And basically I have told the compiler that my funk diamond inherits from this solid state diamond contract. And all I'm doing is inheriting all of the required implementation needed to be a valid diamond. And I'll show you what I mean a little bit later when we pull up the next web-based tool, which is called Looper. But first I'm going to go over to the side panel and compile this. Once it's compiled, we can go over to the deploy tab and I am connected to the Rinkeby test network at the moment. So I'm going to use the injected provider MetaMask. And you can see that it's connected to Rinkeby. I'm gonna make sure that Funk Diamond is selected and hit deploy. This will bring up MetaMask. I will sign this transaction. Great, now it's deployed and we have a contract. I'm gonna go ahead and copy the address for this contract. And in order to better work with diamonds using this next tool looper, your contracts need to be verified. And so in order to verify, we can use a plugin. If you go to the plugins button on the left hand side, there is an Etherscan contract verification plugin. So you can actually add that plugin to Remix or you could use the Sourceify plugin. Both will do the same thing and Looper is able to read from both of these. But in this case, I'm going to use Etherscan because I already have it set up. I'm going to select my contract, which is the Funk Diamond, and then I'm just going to paste in the address. Now you can see that the contract was verified and then a new browser tab, I'm going to open looper.dev. Now Looper is an online tool made specifically for working with diamond proxies. Uh, you can work with Diamond Proxies somewhat on uh, sites like Etherscan or Block Scout, but they don't actually have all of the features that take advantage of the power of Diamond Proxies. So I actually built Looper myself in order to work with diamonds in a more diamond-centric way. So in order to view our diamond, we're going to paste the address in the address bar. Because I know it's deployed to the Rinkeby network, we can choose the Rinkeby testnet over here and then click the magnifying glass. And because it's verified, it pulls up all the details, the name of the contract, and all of the methods included in the contract. And these are all of the methods that were included in the solid state diamond implementation. So you have things like facet, 
address, facets, facet function selectors. These are all things that help you basically read information about your diamond and also do things like upgrades and downgrades and adding and removing functions, etc. In this case, we don't actually care about this particular facet right now. Um, we're gonna go ahead and add a new facet and I'm gonna show you how easy that is by going back to Remix. So if we go back to Remix in our file explorer, I'm going to add a new file. I'm gonna call it message facet. We'll add all of our comments and the solidity version at the top. So now I have an empty contract and we could actually add this contract as part of the diamond, but it's not going to do anything. The whole point of adding contracts to your diamond is to add more functionality. So in this facet, all we're gonna do is allow a user to set a message and also retrieve that message. Now, one thing you have to note about diamond proxies is that because they are a proxy, you have to take into account how storage is mapped on the proxy. So in Solidity, you can do something called a delegate call, which basically takes one contract and uses the implementation in another contract as like it was part of the main contract. So for example, this contract, this message facet contract is going to have a few methods set and get. Our diamond is going to delegate call to this contract utilizing the functionality of those functions, but utilizing them as if they were part of the diamond contract itself. So any storage you write to is going to affect the storage of the main diamond contract and not this message facet contract. So we can't actually create local variables to this contract because if you add any other contracts after this contract, any writes you do to variables in this contract could affect variables in the other contract because each of these contracts is going to be utilizing the storage map of the main contract. Every variable you put into a contract starts at storage slot zero and then increments after that. So if I have a variable, for example, here, uh, let's just do uint 256a, and then I have another contract that also has a uint 256 named something else. If I write to this variable, it's going to overwrite the other contract. And in turn, if the other contract writes to that variable, it's going to overwrite this contract. So we don't want that. And one way to avoid that is to specify specific storage slots in storage for the contract to use. And we can do that by specifying something kind of random and something that we know that another contract isn't likely to use. So we're gonna do it like this. So here we've created an internal constant and an internal constant actually does not get stored in storage. It actually becomes part of the contract bytecode at compile time. So it's not going to affect any storage slots. And all we've done is taken just a random message or a random string message.facet and put it through the kekek 256 function, which outputs a byte 32 string. You don't really have to think too much about it, but just know you can actually use this byte 32 string to reference a slot in storage and actually start storing things there. And when you're building your diamonds, you kind of want to keep a standard way of building these namespace strings so you can kind of keep things organized. So for example, in this message facet, I just use message.facet. If I have a foo facet, I might want to do a namespace there called foo.facet. Just, it could be anything you want, just try and keep things neat and organized. The next thing I'm gonna do is create a layout for the storage for this specific facet. You can do that using a struct. And in this struct, you just add all the variables that you're going to use as part of your layout. In this case, the only thing we care about is a message string. So we're just going to add this string message here. Now, in order to manage the storage and make sure it's being saved and retrieved from this exact storage slot, we need to create a special retrieval function in order to retrieve that storage from that slot. So this function right here does a little bit of fancy stuff with assembly, but it's actually not that hard when you look deep into it. So what it does is returns an instance of a storage struct 
Um, and we also got to tell the Solidity compiler that this is going to be storage and not something like memory. Uh, so we take the namespace that we defined above, set it into this position variable, and then we create an assembly block. And the assembly block allows you to do some fancy tricks in assembly. We're not doing anything that fancy here, but what this allows us to do is set the slot from storage that we actually want this storage struct S to be referenced at. So all we do is take the slot and set it to position. And we don't have to do anything else because if you have a returns statement up at the beginning of the function, then Solidity already knows to return this. And all it's going to do is return this storage layout at this position. And that's it. So now we can use this in our other functions to read and write from this storage layout. Next thing we're going to do is create a setter method. So here our set message function accepts a string message. It's external because it needs to be able to be called from the outside. And the first thing we need to do is go ahead and fetch this instance of our storage layout. So we can create a variable called storage and we just set it to the output of the get storage method. Next, we want to set the actual message inside of that storage struct. So here we take the message variable that's part of that struct and just set it to the message that's passed in as an argument to this function. The next function we need is a getter function, and this is just going to retrieve the value of the message after it's been set. So here this function just returns a string from memory and we return basically the value of the struct that's returned from get storage. So we don't even need to store anything in any um, variables. We can just return after the get storage returns the struct and then just basically return the message. So it's a one liner and it's very simple. And that's it for this facet. And all we need to do now is compile it and deploy it. So here in my tab on the left, I've got auto compile already set so it compiles automatically if we go to the deploy tab we can just go ahead and make sure that message facet is selected and hit deploy great now it's deployed let's go down to our instance copy this address and then we'll go over to etherscan again and verify this contract once again we want to make sure that our message facet contract is selected replace the address with the newly deployed address and then click verify contract our contract is verified if we go back to Looper, we scroll up to the top and there's a button over here called Upgrade Facet. And this allows us to add and remove facets to our diamond. When you click the Upgrade Facet button, you need to connect your wallet and we're gonna connect the same wallet uh, that we used to deploy. And we're just going to paste in the address of our newly deployed contract. And we need to fetch the info about this facet first. And what it does is it grabs both of the external functions of this facet. And if you want, you can only add one of these methods. But in this case, we're going to add both of these because we're going to use both of these. And then once we have all the methods selected, we click add facet, confirm in MetaMask. All right, it's complete. We can go ahead and close this and then reload. And now you can see that we have the message facet as part of our diamond. And we can go ahead and first write a message. So if we go down here to the write button, connect our wallet once more, select the set message uh, method down here, and then we'll just type in what the funk. We'll need to sign in MetaMask. All right, success. Let's close this. And now we can try and read the message. So if we go down here to read, we can select get message and click the read button and it will fetch. And what do you know? We've got what the funk. We've successfully deployed a facet and added it to our diamond. And that's it. That's how you can easily get up and running with diamond proxies using nothing but your web browser. If you're interested in playing around with diamond proxies and just want to get your hands dirty, I recommend you start out with Remix and Looper and just start building what comes to mind and seeing uh, how things work under the hood. And as you've seen from this video, it's actually not that hard to get started. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to smash that like button. If you have any comments or questions, leave them down below. Once again, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.